from the dead. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. We are reading from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20, verses 1 to 9. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter then came out with the other disciple, and they went toward the tomb. They both ran. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the napkin which had been on his head, not lying with the linen clothes but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead the Gospel of our Lord. Christ is risen, alleluia, alleluia. A story is told of our football coach who went out with his boys for a tournament. And he was, or him and the team, were known to win in every tournament that they participated in. And therefore, to him, he knew that this would be another day of victory. So the boys played, and they played, and the first half, the other team had scored one. And they went for round two. And the first five minutes, his team scored. And therefore, it was 1-1. One, one. And given that it was final, the game 
could not have ended in a draw. So there had to be an outright winner. So the game went on. Then first round, a second round also ended. And therefore, they had to be given extra time. And it was the time that uh, there was a principle, those of you who know soccer, that was called dead end. It meant that Mukigia, uh, the first team that scores, the game ends there. I, I guess that ha could have been overturned by now. So, when they got out for the short rest before they went for the uh, the, the extra time. So the coach was hard telling the boys, boys, let us do it. It's not over until it is over. Remember, this game will be decided by the kick that goes in first. And remember, a game can be reversed suddenly, even at the dying seconds. So let's do it. We can do it. So the boys went in, eh? and they did the first round of the extra time, one-one still. Then went to the, the second round of the extra time. And in the last three seconds, before the whistle blew, his team scored. The last seconds saw him win the tournament as it has always been. And as they were celebrating, he told the boys, thank you. Remember, it was on, almost sure that uh, we were to end up in shootouts. And they knew that Historically, they, are, they were never good in penalty shoot, shootouts. And he said, remember, always, the last minute is important. And it cannot be over until the whistle blows. Dear good people, this is precisely what happened to Jesus. Remember, on Good Friday... People thought that it was over. Remember on Good Friday, we reflected on the death of death. Jesus is dead and buried. He is finished. Or so they thought. But what they did not know was that there was one more chapter left in the life story of Jesus. They, have go, they had gone through all the chapters, but they had forgotten there was the final chapter. It is not over until it is over. There is victory after a seeming defeat. There is resurrection after crucifixion. There is laughter, there is life after death. No wonder that you were told that yes, on Good Friday, death died. And what was meant for our annihilation gave us life, goodness, and victory. No wonder we called it good. Because what was meant for our death eventually it became good for us. The Lord is not dead. He is risen. Alleluia, alleluia. This Sunday, Easter Sunday, the Sunday of all Sundays, I am sure some people may say, yet it's Easter. After all, it is Easter under the lockdown. Here in Kenya, We've got some five counties who are not able to congregate as we do today and other counties, other 42 counties. And the five counties that are under lockdown, 
I know your frustrations. But I also want to tell you that there, we, we've, we've got still many other countries in Europe which have actually been uh, under lockdown for many months now. And therefore, because of the, the length of time of lockdown, frustrations and anger, so we may want to ask, it is Easter, so what? After all, remember, we didn't go on Good Friday for the way of the cross. We did not attend the Vigil Mass. We did not even go for the Palm Sunday. So, and we are not able to go to church and celebrate. So, why, what would be so good about Easter? Now, this kind of reaction is becoming common to so many people, and especially because of the reality of this pandemic. Of course, there is also the impact of secularism in other parts of the world. There is also the, there is also the impact of materialism and of course, egoism upon the minds and attributes and attitudes of people. It is so strong that spiritual values are now deemed useless and obsolete. So, it is quite important to clarify and emphasize the meaning of this very important celebration. All the above plus pandemic and our miseries not with his standing. So, what does Easter really mean? What is the connection of the resurrection of Jesus to our present life in this world? What is the connection of the resurrection of Jesus to our present situation those of us who are under the lockdown, those who are unwell, those who are jobless, those who are wailing, those who are grieving. Number one, we must remind ourselves time and again that everything in this world is passing away. Everything. Nothing is permanent here. Not ourselves, not our jobs, not our papers, not our connections, not our relationships, nothing. Nothing is permanent here. Eventually, everything will collapse and dissipate. What will happen then? We just cannot continue ignoring the heavenly and eternal realities. And we may want to ignore because of our situations. Hence, in his letter to the Colossians, St. Paul honestly exhorts us. And I read 3, verse 1 and 2. If you then were raised with the Christ, seek what is above where Christ is seated at the right hand of dead of God. Think of what is above, not of what is on earth. Colossians 3, 1 to 2. I remember on Monday, on Monday, no, on Sunday night, last Sunday night, I gave a reflection on death. It was requiem mass for a religious sister who had left us. And I remember I shared with the congregation the eight things that death does not do or the eight areas where death is powerless or the eight things that death cannot take away. And I remember I want to mention, I think, number six or number seven, number six. I think the, everything is here, yeah. Number six uh, of the eight things that death cannot take away is our heavenly reality and hope. Hope of the heavenly reality. Now, this is important. No wonder we must remind ourselves. Again, I want to read. If you then were raised with Christ, seek 
what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think of what is above, not of what is on earth. Because what is above will not be taken away by death. What is above will not be taken away by our frustrations. What is above will not be taken away by the betrayal as we did here on Friday. What is above cannot be taken away by our illnesses and diseases, terminal or otherwise. What is above remains. The resurrection of Jesus tells us that there is a future in store for us. There is heaven we can look forward to when this transitory world passes away. There is life after death. This world will pass away with all its beauty, with all the glamour, with everything that we cherish here on earth will pass away. But then we have our eternity with God. Hence, we ought not to focus our attention only on this material world, which can be, by the way, a temptation. Sometimes we may get so attached. We may get so attached to what's happening here. We were hurt here. So we are so, we are so attached to the world where our dreams died where we got our heart broken and therefore we are still holding on the pain of them the days. I remember among the things that gives us spiritual affliction or spiritual conflict, among the things that give us spiritual conflict is attachment to the past hearts. Kushikiria vidoda za zama, zamani. Kuna mtu wali nikosea those days. Meshikiria pale. My life has been a lot of cause of issues. I'm there, still there, I'm still there. Even that, that attachment to this material world is what gives us Long, long moment of unhappiness. That is not exactly what God wants for us. Listen to what St. Paul says again. We look not to what is seen, but to what is unseen. For what is seen is transitory. What is unseen is eternal. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. So the question we need to ask ourselves today is, as we say, I will not die, but I will live to tell of the goodness of the Lord. What we must ask ourselves is, where is our attention? Our attention may be to that which is tactile and seen. Tunaweza tukaiguza na tukaiona. We may be attached there. It is the material world. You may have noted that we, have, we may have a lot of things. But one thing, one reality hits home when we die. When we die, you can imagine the size of the grave. We try. We try so much, especially when we are affluent and uh, materially and old. We try to to spread as much as we can when we are burying somebody. And you know, we may use a coffin worth millions. If you didn't know, there are coffins worth millions. Coffins. But what is material passes? You may use that. You may use all the things that we can do. We can, the, the regard here to adorn them as we bury them. But you see, resurrection will not be, will not be uh, determined 
by the quality of the coffin that buried us. That does not sound good. However, it is so true. Did you know, <laughs> even, if you go, even if you are buried naked, you will resurrect. Shida yetu, tumeshikiria vitu za dunia, material world. I know you don't know, but I can tell you that there are people in this world who have insured their bodies. Bodies. Did you know there is a, a gracious woman in this world who has insured her tongue? Tongue. Did you know that? To a tune of 200 million. Did you know? <laughs> There is somebody who has insured her legs <laughs> to a tune of 316 million Kenya shillings. Migu. There is a footballer who has insured his legs <laughs> more than 108 million Kenya shillings. Did you know there is a gracious lady who has insured her smile? Aki Zidia Zidi. Idu mia iko na mambo, eh? A smile. Naona kama nita injua yagu. But you see, what is my point? My point is, you may even get angry. There is one guy who got angry and injured every, every part of his body. A lot of money. When, and we are, we are insuring that which is dying. That which is transitory. That is how we can forget about the spiritual realities and the heavenly realities. I have no problem with even you, and those of you listen to me, I have no problem with you insuring any of your body parts. I have no problem. But my question is, is that where our focus is? I have no problem for us looking good. I have no problem. I have no problem for us decorating our dead as we bury them. I have no problem. I have no problem using very expensive coffins and whatever as we bury them. I have no problem. I have no problem even if we were to spend billions and trillions of money as we bury them. I have no problem. But I have only one question. Where is our focus? If you're able to answer that, that if we focus our attention on only on this material world, our joy is short-lived because material world will pass. Material world is characterized by that which is seen and tactile. What is eternal, however, is, is unseen, it cannot be touched. Number two, our life in this world, aside from being transitory, is also a long and odious journey. At some point in our lives, we have to ask ourselves, where am I heading? Where am I heading? One of the principles in marriage therapy, we say that uh, we do not get married on account of where we are, but we get married on account of where we are going. It means until such a time that a young woman knows where she is going, she is not ready for marriage. Until such a time that a young man is, knows, is very clear about where he is headed, he is not ready for marriage. In the absence of that knowledge, marriage is not possible. And in the event it is concocted, we have a problem. In the event it is concocted, then there will be a problem. The same happens in our Christian life. Do we really know where we are headed? 10 or 20 years from now. 
or 30 or 40, we may want to ask, what will happen to me? What will turn of me? When I grow old, what will I do? Mm -hmm. When all of my children, those of you who are moms and dads, when all of my children are grown up and have families of their own, where will I go? There's a young lady who asked me the other day. Uh, they have, I think, four kids. So you told me that, Father, me and my husband are not talking to one another. We have four children. We are in our early 40s, both of us, and we are not talking. Our firstborn has finished university, and the other three are still coming up very fast. They are both between the ages of 22 and 12. So that means very soon, before we are even 60, chances are all these children will have gone out of the cage. So what will happen to us? Today we are young and we cannot talk to one another. And our children are with us because all our children are in these schools. So what will happen when it will only be the two of us? And that is where now I started now guiding her on something we call growing old graciously. Because the most painful moment and the most painful loneliness is when you are both graciously growing old. But there is a lot of bitterness and hatred between the two of you. That will be the most hurtful, the most painful of old age. And maybe it's good to ask this question, even today. Maybe it is a good Sunday to pose this question to the couples listening to me. If your children are still with you, what is the status of your relationship? Ask yourself as a couple, 20 years from today, if, you have, if your last born is 10 years, 20 years from today, your last born will be 30. There is no way when your last born is 30 and you, you are also 30. So chances are your last born will be 30 and you will be past 50 there. So a time comes, you are both old and maybe there is no life. So ask yourself, what happens? Sometimes, and this is the greatest weakness of humanity, sometimes we behave as if we are not growing old. Sometimes we behave as if time is static. Time is there, waiting for us to do all manner of things. Time is not going. Time, if you look at your watch, something is moving constantly. Okay, nakama ni functional. Najua naweza kuwa nayo. Na battery ilikufa. If you look at your watch, kama ni zile za nini, kuna kitu kanaenda round. That true. If you have those ones that are a bit digital, they are there is something that is blinking. Is that okay? Inside your watch there is a movement. Munaangalia mkiwa serious. Hata wenye mko na na saa ya roho. Hata wenye mnaangalia gajua. Hata jua huenda. Isn't it? So the movement you see in your watch is the reality and proof enough that life is not waiting for us. So we need to ask, where am I headed? Naenda wapi? And then eventually we face the inevitable question. And I love this. When I die, what happens next? Ultimately, we have to ask, what is the meaning of my life? Why was I created? When I die, how many people will genuinely, se genuinely celebrate the time that I lived? Genuinely. Instead of philosophizing, saying that, you know, especially in Africa, we don't talk bad things about the dead. You see, whether we say it or not, 
the reality is out there. Even if we are burying somebody who lived a very bad life, and then we lie to the world, nothing has changed. We are only becoming a bit economic with the truth. And becoming economical with the truth does not change the reality of the bad life that was lived. Becoming economical with the truth and trying to be a bit prudent and diplomatic, it does not take away the pains and the hurt and the frustrations that were caused by the life of the person we are burying. We might decide, if you like, to lie to ourselves. But there is something that will never go away. How the person lying here made me feel. You see, that now helps us to ask the value of my life. And who else is benefiting from my life? If I was to go today, how many people will say, I thank God I met Mr. So-and-so. I thank God I met Mrs. So-and-so. I thank God that I met Miss So-and-so. I thank God. I thank God that I met Bishop So-and-so. I thank God that I met my apostle. I met Pastor So-and-so. I met So-and-so. I thank God. You know, in the Gospels, Jesus gives us all the answers to the questions that we, ha we have been asking. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. He is the bread that gives us everlasting life. He is the beginning and the end. Now look at this um, if you look at this, this Easter cuddle, this Easter cuddle, you can see it has inscriptions. Every Easter Sunday and the whole of Easter will be, we will be having this Easter with us, this, this cuddle with us. This is the cuddle that we, we were able to write last night. This cuddle has got the alpha and the Omega. Jesus is the beginning and he is the end. The Alpha and the Omega. He is, he is the beginning. He is the beginning and he is the end. Every time you see this, I hope you remember what we talked about um, last night about this card and the inscriptions. I know we'll have a separate uh, devotion on this, but it's important that when you see this, we don't just write we are saying that Jesus is the beginning and the end. We are getting the answers to the questions that we have. He is the beginning and the end. He is, as you can see, he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He and the Father are one. Mm -hmm. He is God. He is our salvation. And all his teachings and declarations are all proven very true because of this day, resurrection. He is God. And one writer says that as God, he was too big to fit in a grave. So the grave could not contain him because he was not meant for death. He was meant for life. And the same we are reminded, even as we are not meant for death, we are meant for life. St. Paul declared in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and I read, And if Christ has not been raised, then empty too is our preaching. Empty too your faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. If we are looking for answers to all life's questions, then Jesus has all the answers. And his answers are all proven true and ratified by his resurrection. We can depend, therefore, on the absolute 
veracity of his teachings, which will help us find meanings and directions in life. Jesus is the ultimate answer to everything in this world. He is the ultimate answer to our pain. He is the ultimate answer to our tears. He is the ultimate answer to our brokenness. He is the ultimate answer to our rejection. He is the ultimate answer to our betrayals. In fact, we say that every time we face betrayals, please let us know we have got the firstborn, if you like, the firstborn who sends the betrayal, Jesus Christ himself. He knows the pain of betrayal. He knows the pain of rejection. He knows the pain. So, without Jesus, we are lost. And not just lost, we are actually lost forever. With Jesus, we will find life in its fullness. John 10:10, 10, 10, we hear, I came so that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Now you understand why I have always said that on the side of Jesus, life can only get better. If we were to radically understand who Jesus is in our lives, I can tell you this today. There would be no suicides in this world. None. There would be no homicide in this world. None. Because once we have the right answer, we are good to go. Our predicament is we are able to ask the right questions. The right questions about our life situations. But rarely do we get the right answers. Because it's like we sidestep Jesus and look for other things. That is why in this world we have so many dramas happening even in churches. To some of us, our pastors, our apostles, our prophets, our prophetesses, our oracles, our everything have become more important than Jesus Christ. In fact, some of them have replaced Jesus. So some of us are more loyal to the people, more afraid of the people, than to Jesus himself. The moment we sidestep our Jesus, now I can tell you for free, pain will be with us for days without end. Because the people we have taken as our small gods, they will die one day. I remember. Oh, yes, I do. A religious leader who died in this country, in one part of this, of this country. And the followers of that church and the family were at the pain to see that the guy is dead. Because the, they had been made to believe that the guy will live eternally. All of us will die. Dear good people, put your hope in Christ. Your priests will die. Your pastors will die. Your oracles will die. Your apostles will die. Your prophets and prophetesses will die. And please do not be surprised when they die and you die and you go to heaven and you cannot fight them. Please, don't be a slave to your preachers. Do not be a slave. If you are to be a slave, be one of Christ. You will never be disappointed. Never, ever. Never, ever. I'm loving this. Number three. Every day, we are confronted with our weaknesses and shortcomings, our inadequacies and failures. We look for a source of power to give us strength, to give us encouragement, and to give us support. Jesus is the ultimate source of power in heaven and on earth. Please let us note that 
Jesus is the ultimate source of power in heaven and on earth. Not our people. Not our people. Not our leaders. Not anybody else. Jesus is. With his resurrection, he is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, and he fulfills his promise to us. In John 14, 14, we read, If you ask anything of me in my name, I will do it. This is the reason why every time we pray at Mass and in many other liturgical celebrations, we always end with a phrase, we ask this through Christ our Lord. Now you understand. Yes, we are weak. That is true. But Jesus is our strength. Please don't, don't concentrate on your weakness. And I want to speak to somebody who is struggling with something. Maybe you have been trying to fight a certain addiction. And you have tried. You are almost giving up, saying that this is my fate, this is our lot. No. None of us was created to be defined through a weakness. None of us was created to be defined through a certain habit. None of us was created to be defined through some addiction. No. Right now, you may be going through that addiction. My dear friend, my dear brother, my dear sister, I have always told you, your current circumstance is not your conclusion. And your current circumstance is not your definition. That is not your identity. Yes, you are struggling. Your identity is not what you are struggling with. Please know, where you are weak, please see Jesus as your strength. Yes, we are. There is weakness, but there is one who is strong through and through. This is what he revealed to St. Paul. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So whatever the situation is, my grace is sufficient for you. You know, and this led the Apostle Paul to conclude in 2 Corinthians 12, 10. I will rather boast most gladly of my weaknesses in order that the power of Christ may dwell with me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul said that when he realized or when he tasted, if you like, when he tasted Christ. When we taste Christ, we focus our attention from our weaknesses, from our addictions, from our life situations, from those death-like situations, we focus our attentions to him who is the source of our strength. And we never get tired of going to him. You know why? Because he never gets tired of listening to us. In Jesus, there is power. In Jesus, there is victory. In Jesus, there is salvation. The resurrection of Jesus then is not something remote and detached from our life. What I've been doing is to connect our situation and the resurrection of Jesus and then see ourselves right in the middle of it. In fact... Our life finds its source, its power, and meaning in the resurrection of Jesus. Hence, as God's people, we gather to worship every Sunday, the day of the Lord, because we joyfully celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. So, my dear brothers and sisters, whatever happens to us, and to the world, whatever, we will always proclaim that immutable and wonderful truth. Jesus is alive. He is risen. He is Lord. Jesus is alive. 
Jesus is risen. He is Lord. This truth gives us hope. This truth gives us joy. And this truth gives us assurance of our final victory and eternal salvation. Knowing that we may be in darkness today, we may be in trouble today, we may be in some pain today, in some form of brokenness today, but remember, there is final victory that is coming because he is our power, he is the resurrection, he is our victory, he is our salvation. Happy Easter. Thank you.